Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. Welcome everyone to today's program, Men's Pelvic Floor, the Science and Strategies. I'm Katie Armsby with Cancer Support Community Atlanta. If this is your first time joining a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we welcome you. We invite you to visit our website down at the bottom there, cscatlanta.org, where you can see all the programs, oncology programs that we offer virtually and in person here in Atlanta across from Northside Hospital. Uh, our programs include support groups for those diagnosed with cancer and caregivers. We have virtual and in-person support groups, stress reduction programs like yoga, tai chi. We have a monthly oncology nutrition seminar led by an oncology dietitian with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. We also have a really fun cooking demo that happens monthly here at um, our location as well. So we invite you to join us for that and you get to taste delicious food. And then we offer, of course, education programs like these. So for details on all these programs and registering, again, feel free to click that cscatlanta.org. And I'll also put that website into the program chat box. I'm excited to welcome today uh, Keisha Lawson. Keisha received her master's degree at North Georgia and State University and doctorate degree at Alabama State University. She received her certification as a pelvic floor rehabilitation practitioner and specializes in pelvic floor, dry needling, and orthopedics. Keisha Lawson began working with Northside Hospital Rehabilitation Services in September 2021. So welcome, Keisha, and I'm going to pass it off to you to get us started. Hello, welcome everyone. We're so excited that you guys have decided to join us. I'll um, be introducing um, our speaker, Dr. Herman Baga. He is a graduate from the John Hopkins School of Medicine and he earned a fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. He's considered one of the top urology programs in the world. He practices um, with advanced urology where he cares for both male as well as female patients and he provides thoughtful and holistic medical surgical care for issues such as urinary problems for bladder or prostate issues, erectile dysfunction, testosterone deficiency, and Peyronie's disease. Dr. Baga is strongly experienced in the care and management of general, excuse me, genital urinary cancers and general urology. He has performed thousands of procedures and cared for countless patients, and he believes every procedure and patient to be unique and important. Thank you, Dr. Baga. Thank you. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I really appreciate it. This is just an awesome group. Uh, I've heard so many good things about and you saw all those resources they have. Just a great group. I'm glad to be a uh, part of uh, one of your presentations. Keisha, thanks for doing this with me. Uh, I think this is some really good information that uh, often isn't talked about as much as I think it should be. Uh, and Keisha, you know that for sure as well, is male, male pelvic floor dysfunction. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the causes and symptoms of male pelvic floor dysfunction. So, so we can go to the next slide. So what is the pelvic floor? Really, the pelvic floor muscles is this intricate, just delicate uh, framework of muscles that support that entire pelvic floor for a man. Uh, and it's really a network of muscles, ligaments, connective tissues, all of that pelvic base that almost serves as a hammock. And it's supporting that entire pelvic floor and all the organs above it. Uh, and it's very important for urinary, bowel, sexual function, because there are just a few openings within that hammock. You know, one of those openings is for the urinary tract so that the urine can pass through. Another is for some of the bowel so that the bowel can pass through and you can defecate. Um, also, of course, there's sexual function there. The testis, they've got their cords that are running through it. So there's just a few genital urinary organs and bowel organs that are going through and piercing through this floor. And so those are being particularly supported. Uh, and so when there's any sort of problems with the pelvic floor, it's this is why those symptoms can often, those uh, systems can often be affected. 
So pelvic floor problem, just as I was mentioning, this is another view. You can kind of see it on the side. You can see how that urinary system with the bladder and the urethra is passing right down through that pelvic floor, the anus and the lower end of the rectum. Some of the sexual organs are also being supported like the base of the penis, all by this pelvic floor, which is denoted by that that um, that red U and that little um, tail on it as well, that's denoting that pelvic floor. These pelvic floor muscles are actually wrapping pretty firmly around these passages where these organs are you know, piercing through. Uh, and so when those muscles get too weak, there can be issues. When these muscles get too tight, there can be issues. Or often when they get spastic, they can also cause these intermittent sort of issues that can occur. So urinary symptoms are worth talking about first. Um, weakened when you have a weak pelvic floor, it can cause urinary leakage. You know, so again, you've got the bladder and the urethra that's running through. The bladder itself for a male has got several different ways where it kind of supports itself and prevents leakage. One of that is through what's called the internal urinary sphincter. That's kind of the bladder neck. Then there's the external urinary sphincter, um, which is a um, a uh, muscular kind of donut that helps to prevent leakage of urine, but all of that is also supported by the pelvic floor. And if the pelvic floor gets weak, it reduces some of the support that you might get at that external urinary sphincter. And as a result, you can end up with leakage. Now for men, they usually don't see too much of that leakage because we have those other sphincters as well. But those other sphincters can get affected during other treatments, uh, which we'll talk about later, whether it be surgical, radiation, things like that. And then that pelvic floor becomes responsible for a lot more of the work and weakened it can, can end up causing leakage issues. Now on the flip side, what about a tight pelvic floor? That can cause a lot of issues as well. What happens is when you've got a tight pelvic floor that's wrapped around that urethra and causing a constriction, that back pressure can start to damage the bladder, right? At the end of the day, you can think of the bladder almost as a pump. And when you kick the hose to a pump, well, what happens to that pump? Initially, that pump is just going to keep functioning. It's going to keep pushing through, and you may not even realize there's a problem. But over time, all that extra back pressure that occurs to that pump causes it to start to malfunction, it starts to sputter, and then eventually can get permanently damaged. Well, a very similar situation can happen to the urinary bladder. If that tight pelvic floor is really tight, it's constricting things, maybe it's spasming on things and causing a kink in the tube. So it's causing a kink in the urethra, which is affecting the bladder, which is like a pump. Well, then that bladder can start to have problems. That bladder can start to initially overheat and have some issues. Similar to a sputtering pump, the symptoms can vary. You can have urinary frequency, which is going often. You can have nocturia, which is getting up at night. You might have urgency, which is rushing to the bathroom, maybe dripping of urine when you're done urinating. All these things are your bladder saying, basically asking for some help, saying, hey, I'm blocked up. You know, I'm having some issues. I'm starting to be like a sputtering pump and starting to have those issues. And over time, that bladder can actually get more damaged as well due to that high pressure environment. And that's when you can start to have pain or other sort of consequences. So the pelvic floor is very intricate, very um, involved in that urinary system because it's it's really mechanically there, supporting it, providing support, providing some continence. And when it's too tight, it can cause the opposite issue where it can start to cause damage to the bladder and above, which can result in dysfunction as well. Bowel symptoms can also be seen. Uh, similarly, the bowel is, you know, going through. Uh, and this is on the right side, you see a depiction of if what if the muscles are too tight, right? But you can also have the other opposite. So you can have loss of control because there's less support. So you can end up having leakage of stool, maybe leakage of mucus that is naturally created in the GI tract and is not being stopped. So it can start to leak. You can have issues with flatus control. Um, you can also have rectal urgency uh, where, you know, without that proper support, uh, you can start to have those problems. Similarly, when there's undue pressure on the bowel, uh, that can, you know, start to change the entire dynamic of the pressure system within the bowel, and that bladder can become dysfunctional, and that can cause some of the urgency. Weak pelvic floor can result in prolapse. It's not quite as common in men because we have so many organs that we have the way things are 
um, set up. It's a little bit less likely to happen, but that is a certain risk as well, especially when there have been certain surgeries that have been done on the rectum or the bowel, as we do for cancer surgery. Uh, and then you have that pelvic floor, which is not as supportive anymore, allowing for some prolapse. Constipation, pain and spasm issues, this is all due to this change in pressure within the bowel caused by the pelvic floor uh, being too tight, too weak, or spasming and causing intermittent issues. Sexual dysfunction is another thing that we often see. So you can see on the right side of the screen as well. Again, you can see that depiction of that pelvic floor, which is that solid red line with that little tail on it. Um, these uh, pelvic floor muscles support a lot of the sexual organs, particularly there's some support underneath the penis. There's some of the bubble cavernosus muscles and other pelvic floor muscles in that region. Um, and also right below the prostate in the prostate and the seminal vesicles, number four is those seminal vesicles, and number two is the prostate. It's through that pathway that the ejaculate comes out. And when the pelvic floor muscles are too tight, it can disrupt the flow of that ejaculate, and you can have what's called ejaculatory dysfunction. That can mean reduced ejaculate that comes out. Uh, that can be unusual for a man. Also, it can affect fertility. Sometimes uh, that ejaculate will actually go backwards and go into the bladder, mixes in with the urine, and then gets peed out. That's not a nidus for infection, but you can see some abnormalities in the urine sometimes. You can sometimes have altered sensation because again, these muscles are really kind of around that, around those sexual organs and can kind of constrict some of the nerves that are passing uh, sensation back and forth. You can also, that can result in penile or genital pain. Another thing is testicular pain. Uh, you can see that as well. Um, and I think I may have another slide about that coming up. So oh, there we go. So pelvic pain. Um, again, uh, perineal pain is probably the more common uh, symptom that we see with pelvic floor dysfunction. So again, the perineum is the area that's between the anus and the scrotum or your sac. So that area is where there's a, a lot of pelvic floor muscles responsible for holding up a lot of those organs in the way that we described. When those muscles get spastic and they get tight, especially, you can start to feel pain in that area. Uh, genital pain can occur, again, pain at the base of the penis specifically, although that pain can then be referred to the end of the penis or the tip of the penis, just the way that that penis is wired. Testicular pain is another thing that we commonly see. So the testis have got uh, what are called the spermatic cores that travel into the body, and those are passing by the pelvic floor muscles as well. So when those pelvic floor muscles get tight, it's almost like a vice grip that's kind of supporting everything and spasming and tightening everything. And you can imagine having that kind of pressure on organs as sensitive as the testis, uh, which is are among some of the most sensitive organs in a man's body, can really result in this long-term testicular pain. It can be chronic. Sometimes it can be intermittent where it comes and goes, but I've met a lot of men where it's a constant pain as well. Rectal pain as well, you can see that that red, the red part of that image over there, tightness in the rectum can cause pain, discomfort, this issue with nerve entrapment, you know, as these nerves are piercing through for these organs through that pelvic floor uh, can also cause a lot of issues. Again, it usually starts as a little bit of a spastic pain, so people might feel that's an intermittent sort of thing, but it can become chronic or long term, uh, just as those muscles get as they start to spasm, they're working out, right? So as you work out any sort of muscle, it starts to get thicker and thicker and just tighter all the time because it's so muscular. And as those muscles get tighter and tighter and thicker, this can turn into unfortunately a chronic sort of pain or other symptoms as a result. So what are the causes of pelvic floor dysfunction? Um, you know, one very notable to this group, of course, would be pelvic surgery and radiation, which is often done for cancer treatments. Prostate cancer surgery is, uh, is very uh, commonly done for the treatment of prostate cancer, one of the very common cancers in the United States. One in seven men is diagnosed with prostate cancer in the United States. Thankfully, we don't always require treatment, but for those who have the higher risk type of cancer, they may choose to undergo surgery to have their prostate removed. When that prostate is removed, 
um, that pelvic floor gets affected because we have to, you know, kind of dissect out that prostate in a way that results in some uh, weakness to that pelvic floor, not to mention weakness of some of the other continent mechanisms for the bladder, such as that sphincter, both the internal and external sphincters. As a result, there's a weakened pelvic floor along with a weakened sphincter, men can have leakage of urine. Um, colorectal surgery, similarly, sometimes when there's removal of the rectum or of the colon, that can cause issues. When there's a removal of the rectum, uh, it can directly damage those muscles uh, that are occurring as well as some of those intervening nerves. Also, just lower colonic sort of surgery has a, a network of nerves that can be affected while things are being dissected. And those nerves are actually responsible for helping to innervate some of those pelvic floor muscles as well. So you can end up with... Um, with um with dysfunction from that perspective uh, other injuries and accidents can also be seen sometimes it's an obvious injury uh, you know maybe um, a perineal injury where the perineum was specifically hit or hurt car accident god forbid things like that but other accidents can cause it too chronic bike riding for example you're always kind of hitting that perineal area where those pelvic floor muscles are and a lot of the nerves that help to control them are running and that chronic kind of damage um, from continued bike riding can cause it for some people so it's not always one discrete event. You kind of have to evaluate uh, what are potential risk factors there. Um, other causes, obesity, uh, you know, when you feel the pelvic floor muscles, again, are kind of really holding up uh, all of the that all of the organs above the pelvic floor. As you have obesity, you're adding a lot of weight, and a lot more that those pelvic organs have to, the pelvic floor has to support. When it has to support more, it's got to get stronger, it's got to get tighter, it's got to get, it gets more spastic. So you can end up having dysfunction with some of the sequelae that we discussed. Constipation, um, also is an interesting one because it can cause a bit of a direct effect, specifically on urinary symptoms. The bowels are actually sitting on top of the bladder like a little hat. And so when there's constipation or even inflammation due to bowel disorders, that can transmit to the bladder and start to cause bladder issues. Also straining, when you're straining for bowel movements or urinary symptom, urinary um, issues, you can sometimes find that those muscles are dealing with all that high pressure environment and it adds pressure to the pelvic floor, makes it dysfunctional. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Boy, I'm so sorry. Now, <clears throat> other causes. <clears throat> Some water, just one second. And while Dr. Baga goes to grab some water, I do want to remind everybody that we have that program chat box. So if you do have questions, feel free to enter those into the program chat box. In a little bit, we'll have Keisha Lawson with Rehab come in and kind of talk about um, some strategies to do to help with your pelvic floor. And I do want to invite everybody again to visit Cancer Support Community Atlanta's website, csdatlanta.org. There we have a video library of a ton of educational programs we've done in the past and other um, some stress reduction classes as well. So feel free to check out our video library at our website and I will let Dr. Baga continue. Oh, Dr. Baga, you're on mute. There we go, sorry for the delay, I just, uh bit of a dry throat, some water will make a big difference. So other causes of pelvic floor dysfunction, often behavioral. So, you know, bladder and bowel habits make a big difference. I tell you, I see a lot of nurses, teachers, busy professionals, doctors. Um, they've gone through this lifetime of, and many, honestly, anybody really, you go through this lifetime of holding your bowels, holding your bladder, you know, waiting for the right time to go to the bathroom, then rushing to the bathroom, straining, getting the urine out, coming back again. All of these sorts of habits where we're holding all the time, these are things where we've been using those pelvic floor muscles to kind of tighten and hold things in for us. So we're given these pelvic floor muscles a workout. 
Um, <clears throat> other things like prolonged sitting, I always tell my patients, you know, our pelvic floor muscles weren't designed for Atlanta traffic where we're sitting for extended periods of time. We're not up, we're not moving. People who are chronically coughing, you're coughing all the time, creating pressure. So you can kind of see a theme here. Any sort of these behaviors where you're increasing pressure in that pelvic cavity where that pelvic floor muscle has got to get tighter and tighter to kind of hold everything in place, that's going to cause it to get thicker, more spastic, and end up causing this pelvic floor dysfunction, which results in all those problems that we've been discussing. <clears throat> Next slide. Physical nerve damage that can also occur, um, that often occurs during surgeries um, or during radiation, especially uh, for potentially people in our audience, again, prostate surgery, colorectal surgery, the radiation that's associated to it, that's affecting all those nerves that help control those pelvic floor muscles and can make them aberrant in the way that they're acting. And there's also functional nerve dysfunction. So maybe the nerves aren't physically damaged, but the way that they're acting can become apparent. Things like stress, anxiety, psychological trauma can actually cause a sympathetic nerve response, which can result in pelvic floor tension. Uh, I often tell people, you know, if you've ever, a good example is if you've ever driven on an icy road or a rainy road, you know, your butt cheeks tighten up and you don't even realize it. That's a stress response. That's a sympathetic surge where all those muscles will tighten up as a result. So you can imagine that's one incident, but if you have overall long-term stress, maybe it's physical stress, you're not getting enough sleep at night, uh, maybe it's psychological stress, stress, anxiety, all of us have so much of that. All of that kind of keeps that sympathetic nervous system revved up, and those muscles are always at least slightly tightened, and that's like getting a bit of a workout all the time. Again, thickening those muscles, making them spastic, and causing that pelvic floor to become dysfunctional. So, you know, that's what really what I wanted to go through a little bit is a little bit of the anatomy, where that pelvic floor is, what it's responsible for, and what causes it to get dysfunctional. Uh, oftentimes when we see that, we'll start with simple behavioral therapies where I advise my patients, you know, don't hold your urine, don't rush, you know, don't, don't strain when you're urinating, don't strain with bowel movements. Um, you know, all these types of things are what we often start with, stress reduction, yoga, therapist, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, we really have to go to the experts when those muscles are tight, they're thick. And send them to folks like Keisha, who can really go through and uh, talk a little bit more about the physical therapy aspect of management of pelvic floor dysfunction, which is just so critical. So I'm going to pass it on to Keisha, and we'll let who hear the rest of the talk. Thanks, Dr. Baga. That was great and very informative. Um, I'm going to um, coattail on that a little bit and talk a little bit about um, physical therapy as it relates to um, male pelvic floor dysfunction and just kind of an overview of what physical therapy is and all the things that it can encompass, both on the assessment side of things as well as on the treatment side. Next slide. So what is pelvic floor physical therapy? Pelvic floor physical therapy is a group of things that you incorporate to address muscles, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, anything as it relates to the pelvic region. So that could even mean something as um, seemingly far removed as the lumbar spine, or it could mean your abdominal core musculature. So anything that attaches in or around the pelvis is essentially a part of the anatomy that pelvic floor physical therapy can address. And as Dr. Baga discussed earlier, these are things that play a really critical role in bowel and bladder function, as well as intimacy with, um, you know, difficulties um, there, um, bowel problems um, we covered earlier, as well as a myriad of urinary um, problems, whether it be a urinary retention or a urinary incontinence, because all of these structures aid in the control of your bowel and bladder function. But at the end of the day, they also have a component of soft tissue and muscular um, attachments that can be influenced 
with proper instruction for either exercise or stretching or whatever the case may be. So pelvic floor physical therapy can improve the strength of those muscles. It can improve the coordination of those muscles. It can even alleviate, alleviate symptoms like um, discomfort and or pain as it relates to either muscle shortening or maybe muscle is too long and it's lacking in support and that's what's causing pain. And it can even address issues as it relates to sexual dysfunction. So Dr. Baga went in, into some detail about some of the specific types of um, dysfunctions that um, male uh, pelvic floor problems can um, speak to. And so I listed just a, a few here that are um, sort of the greatest hits, um, whether it be, uh, you know, prostate cancer, prostatitis, which is, you know, an inflammation of the prostate, which oftentimes in my realm will create pelvic pain and, and tissues that are restrictive and tight as it relates to the support in and around the prostate area. So those can be addressed with um, pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, it could be something on the more urinary side of things as we discussed earlier, like overactive bladder. Um, it could be urinary incontinence um, or control or, you know, of the urine. Um, as it relates to even urinary frequency. Sometimes urinary frequency can be very limiting to a person's um, daily life if you have to time and coordinate all of your activities around whether or not that you have accessibility to a bathroom. We even address um, fecal incontinence where um, maybe you've had an injury and or a surgery um, that's lended to um, difficulty controlling the your bowels and maybe you're having accidents or things like that. Sometimes we can address those things as it relates to just the musculature or we can address them as it relates to diet and stool bulking. And some of those things we'll kind of talk a bit about um, as we move further into the presentation. Um, and we can also um, address incomplete urinary evacuation like feeling that you always have to go and then you attempt to go, but never feeling that you're done. A lot of those um, deficits are rooted in soft tissue limitations and muscle dysfunction, as well as, you know, um, poor evacuation practices and habits that we've adopted that directly influence the, the length strength relationships of the musculature that resides inside of our pelvis and pelvic floor. Next slide. So a lot of people come to physical therapy and when they enter into the treatment space, they see weights and they see a recumbent bike and, and they see a treadmill and they, they think, what, what exactly are we going to do here as it relates to my pelvic floor? Are we going to be lifting weights and doing all these types of things? And the answer to that is maybe. But before we develop the treatment plan, we have to talk about the evaluation. And what that entails is you and I sit down or you and your therapist would sit down and go over your medical history. Um, we would go over any diagnostic testing that you may have had done or like um, Dr. Baga would have ordered prior to you know, sending you to um, therapy. We would go over a general musculoskeletal screen, which would involve um, testing the strength of your um, pelvis, of your lower extremities, um, of your core musculature. Oftentimes that incorporates lumbar and low back muscle assessment. Um, and then we would also do an internal rectal muscle exam. And that is very, very important when we talk about different types of deficits as it relates to pelvic floor dysfunction, because as Dr. Baga so eloquently presented earlier, the, the genesis of a lot of our pelvic floor issues and problems are, are coming from the girdle or the support mechanisms of the pelvic floor. And if those supportive mechanisms are deficient, either in length or in strength, the only way to kind of tell what we need to do moving forward to create a treatment plan is to assess the integrity of those structures. And that is done intrarectally. So Physical therapy, pelvic floor, um, oftentimes does include a rectal exam if warranted as it relates to your particular diagnosis. And then 
afterwards, we review the findings, we sit down and we talk about what your particular findings mean for you and your treatment and how we will establish a, a plan of care and come together to decide what exactly we need to do to execute and care for your problem. And then I always allow time during the evaluation sessions for people to ask questions. Um, I welcome questions because I feel like when people have a clear understanding of you know the why of why you need to do what you need to do there, you're very much more likely to get a positive outcome um, when you understand um, the the why of why your care plan looks the way that it looks. So those are just some things that will be encompassed in the evaluation portion of our session. So what do we do for treatment? So to, there are lots of things that we can do, but of the list of things that I'm about to discuss, it is important to note that some of these treatment paradigms are specific to particular diagnoses. And so I'll be going over all of the sort of tools and tricks that can come out of a rehab physical therapy bag, but those particular tools and tricks are specific to a person's diagnosis. And some of them include pelvic floor specific exercises, biofeedback, postural management, because that plays a really big part in the pressure gradient that's created in and around the pelvic floor and the core musculature, neuromuscular re-education, dry needling or perineural needling, and some behavioral modification techniques, as well as manual therapy. So pelvic floor therapy exercises do include some traditional exercises that many people think about when they think about exercises. It also includes, more importantly, pelvic floor specific exercises, and that's as it relates to the muscles of the pelvic floor. For simplicity's sake, it's, it's nice to think about the pelvic floor musculature as having three layers of muscle a superficial layer that you can palpate and feel right underneath the penis and the scrotum, and then an intermediate layer that aids in the restriction and relaxation of the sphincter with respect to like urethrovaginalis muscles and, and things that are like an intermediary between the prostate and the third layer of the pelvic floor, which is the layer that actually attaches to the bony structure of the pelvis itself. And so when we talk about doing pelvic floor specific exercises or what some people refer to as Kegels, it's the encompassing contraction of all of those muscles together and generating an elevation and a depression of these muscles in order to create muscle hypertrophy or strengthen those structures in an effort to retard what could be seen as urinary leakage, for example, because the muscles are weak or um, if you lack enough strength to um, create good uh, evacuation and peristalsis of um, your your bowels, you know you you need support there so that muscles can behave properly, not only to retain but also to relax and evacuate when you're needing to um, have a bowel movement or have a urinary event. So understanding how to um, create muscle tone and strength as well as relaxation is very, very important part of pelvic floor physical therapy as it relates to pelvic floor specific exercises. So what I have here is a, um, a slide of the pelvic floor and it, it kind of goes over just a 3D imagery of what happens when you actually elevate and depress the uh, pelvic floor muscles. Um, I'm gonna see if Katie can fast forward that just a little bit until we get to the portion. There we go, that's good. So um, when we talk about coughing, laughing, sneezing, those things implicate pressure gradient change that occurs in the actual musculature of the pelvic floor. So whenever you improve upon intra-abdominal pressure, you also influence what happens at the pelvic floor. And so that's from a superficial aspect as well as that third layer aspect that we talked about. 
So when we think about pelvic floor strengthening, if you look at this model here, you can appreciate it's the, it's the elevation and depression of those muscles and how that operates together. But what I always like to reinforce is that it is not anything outside of what you see here as it relates to doing a pelvic floor muscle contraction. It is only the elevation and depression of the muscles that are housed in and around the pelvis. Oftentimes people want to create pressure in the abdominal region or the gluteal region, and they wanna use a lot of external accessory musculature. So you don't um, necessarily wanna do those types of things when you're trying to isolate musculature just specific to the pelvic floor. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, the, another mechanism is uh, biofeedback. And what you'll find is that as we talk about a lot of these interventions, there'll be a lot of crosstalk between um, one from one intervention to another because they all coalesce and, and work together um, in different ways. And it's almost like, you know, baking a cake, you know, depending on what type of a cake you want, you may depend, you may want to add sugar or you may want to add chocolate chips, or you may want to add strawberries. So you construct the program based on that individual's needs. And so when we talk about biofeedback, when you do biofeedback, it's a mechanism that allows the patient to uh, perceive an auditory and a visual um, appreciation for what the internal pelvic floor muscles are doing. As we discussed earlier, because these muscles are intrinsic to the pelvis itself, it can be very difficult for a person to figure out whether or not they're actually contracting the appropriate structures or not. And so with the insertion of a rectal probe, you can appreciate what's happening around that area because the probe um, generates a measurement of pressure that is depicted on a screen and so we can see and appreciate when muscle contraction is being performed and when muscle contraction isn't being performed. And we can also use biofeedback in conjunction with rehabilitation and strengthening exercises, because as you may have guessed, it's a strengthening exercise for the pelvic floor is only as effective as your capability to properly do the exercise. And so I often have people come in and say, oh, I went online and I went on YouTube and I looked up how to do a pelvic floor exercise and how to do a Kegel. And I'll say, okay, well, show me your Kegel. And without fail, the first thing they do is an abdominal exercise or abdominal crunch or um, something with the external pelvic floor musculature. And as we saw in the previous slide, while those are all great stability exercises, those don't speak to the musculature that we really need to address to retard some of the earlier deficits that Dr. Baga and myself listed because they don't encompass isolation of the pelvic floor muscle proper. The only way to really appreciate the ability to contract and relax those muscles if you don't have a strong intrinsic proprioceptive awareness and strong intrinsic feedback for that is to either have a tactile feedback situation or to utilize something like a biofeedback. And then once you learn how to properly do the exercise, then you can carry on and do those types of things on your own at home, moving forward as a, just a lifestyle um, benefit of just maintaining good pelvic floor health. Next slide. So another mechanism is something called neuromuscular re-ed. And so um, again, as with the crosstalk, the previous slide talked about biofeedback where we use an indwelling rectal probe to assess and appreciate your contractions and relaxation. That same probe can also be utilized to create a neuromuscular re-education moment for those pelvic floor muscles. So that means without your help or not under your volition, it can de deliver an electrical stimulus to the musculature that in turn will help you to gain more sensory awareness for where those muscles are and improve blood flow to the tissues so that your exercise regime can be more effective and that you can have more neuromuscular uptake and execution when you're actually doing your pelvic floor strengthening program at home. Next slide. 
Another mechanism um, that we use here in physical therapy is dry needling. Um, I specifically utilize peri what's known as perineural needling um, as a restoration property for different types of urinary incontinence. Um, there are several um, different nerve bundles and branches that have shared innervation with the sacral plexus, um, posterior tibial nerve, and things of that nature. That, that nerve tract is actually um, down and around the region of the ankle, for example. So um, the needling protocol is really specific to the type of incontinence um, a person has, where, where, be it urinary versus fecal, um, as far as what nerve innervations are shared with where the deficiency lies. And so um, that is another area of um, strengthening that we can offer or neuromuscular uptake that we can offer by introducing um, perineural needling and providing stimulation directly to um, the needle, which in turn stimulates in and around the neural structures that have a shared sort of um, innervation with the structures in and around your pelvic floor. Dry needling can also be used as a means of pain reduction um, for the perineum and perineal area, like areas that are um, very tight or um, areas where you have a lot of um, hypertrophy, like Dr. Baga discussed earlier, and that muscle spindle is just really, really shortened. You can also use dry needling to dispel um, trigger points or tight muscles in the perineal area that may influence um, your capacity to perform things like urinary evacuation versus bowel evacuation. If indeed the genesis of that problem is rooted in muscle, muscle restriction and muscle tightness. So that is another um, caveat that dry needling can also serve, not just the perineural aspect, but also the, the muscle aspect and um, the uh, muscle tightness um, and trigger point aspect. Next slide. Behavioral modification techniques are huge um, when we talk about physical therapy. Um, one of the things I, I routinely do for folks who come in with some sort of bowel or bladder dysfunction is we sit down and we talk about how to fill out a bladder or bowel diary. And this is, this is helpful because it does two things. Number one, it helps me to kind of get an idea of what your normal routine is like as far as bowel versus bladder evacuation, as well as your intake. Um, and it allows others to kind of appreciate maybe catching some things that they didn't know or weren't aware of that they were um, consciously or unconsciously doing. One of the key things about constipation that we always want to make sure we're doing first is to maintain good and adequate hydration. And a lot of times people will come and they will say, oh, I drink plenty of water. Um, you know, several times throughout the day. And then I'll have them go away and do a, a bowel diary or bladder diary. And when they bring it back, they'll say, you know what? I was very surprised. I really don't drink as much water as I thought I did. Or on the, on the other side of things, if someone is having a lot of urinary urgency and frequency and they will say, well, I don't really go to the bathroom that often. And then they'll do a, a bladder diary and they'll come back and they'll say, you know what? I wake up three, four times every night to go to the bathroom. So these are just things that are very important in helping to identify like what your daily habits are like so that we can kind of help to curtail those habits if they prove to be detrimental to the health of your pelvic floor. Postural training is another um, huge piece I, I like to talk about with folks. Um, particularly when we talk about evacuating and the mechanism for how urinary versus fecal evacuation is supposed to go. Many people think of urinating and defecating as I'm pushing waste out, but as Dr. Baga showed you and we looked at the slides that speak to the internal musculature, each of the outlets in our pelvic floor has a, has a sphincter and those sphincters are always shut at rest. And so um, what happens when we go to the restroom is we have a whole physiologic process of feeling a fullness, be it on the bladder or bowel side of things. 
in an involuntary peristaltic activity or an activity where your smooth muscle lining performs a rhythmic ac activity to drop the bolus or drop the urine. And at which time you get the sensation or the urge that you have to go to the bathroom. When you're actually there, you should be relaxing the muscle and allowing for sphincter relaxation so that you can evacuate. But oftentimes people who suffer from different types of pelvic floor dysfunction have a disconnect between the relaxing for a go and the contracting or the maintaining of stricture to, to maintain continence. And so postural training for evacuation is critical to allow for adequate pelvic floor pressures as a person attempts to evacuate in a way that's more natural to our pelvic floor structure. Education on the impacts of proper diet and hydration, I can't stress enough. Um, people have different nuances with diet depending on their diagnosis that they have to appreciate. And we work very closely um, with the uh, nutritional support team that we have here at Northside. If someone needs specific types of things to address diet, whether it be they're diabetic or they need like an interstitial cystitis diet or something like that, I oftentimes like to refer people to that um, um, service. And I also like to kind of reiterate the importance of just, you know, proper hydration and a proper diet. Because in fact, sometimes what we eat plays a really, really big role in how we evacuate and what we drink. Um, certain things that we drink may create bladder irritation and more urgency. And the same is for certain things that we eat. And so many times people are unaware of how these dietary things are impactful to their urinary versus bowel uh, evacuation. And so that's something else that we like to kind of discuss and go over. As, and lastly, I also like to kind of look at environmental and psychological types of triggers that we may have and how that affects our capacity to eliminate versus retain, um, as well as maybe something like pelvic floor discomfort and or pain, um, sexual trauma, or just associate, associating that area with um, a painful event can oftentimes be very, um, it'd be hard for people to get beyond from a psychological standpoint. So if we address everything on the physiology side from the muscle and soft tissue side, we also have to make sure that we address some of the psychological triggers that may be present as it relates to either pain or, you know, urinary frequency or bowel urgency. Um, oftentimes people, for example, who suffer from urinary urgency will feel more urgent the moment that they get home or as they get closer to home, they'll feel this just tremendous urge that they just can't hold it. Some people it's, you know, just walking past the bathroom or for some it's just getting in a, like walking into a store or a supermarket and being very anxious about um, where the bathroom is. And so recognizing some of the things that create psychological triggers for pelvic floor issues are a part of sort of curtailing um, that effect. And so that is another part of um, sort of recognizing where you are with that. Next slide. Manual therapy is another part of um, pelvic floor uh, treatment. Um, you see this a lot when you, when you have people who have limitations with respect to fascia, which is just that thin layer of connective tissue that interlies between muscle layers or viscera, muscles and tendons, and even some lymphatic structures. Um, if you have any kind of pain or movement limitation with respect to any of those structures, sometimes manual therapy can be um, in order. Oftentimes that will include trigger point releasing and myofascial releasing and different types of manual therapy both to the abdominal region as well as intrarectally. Um, you, you get a, a lot of people who come in with the very, very tight um, pelvic floor musculature um, and they say, oh, every time I feel like I need to, you know, have a bowel movement, for example, and I feel like I'm gonna go and I get there and nothing happens. And then you assess the musculature and find that, you know, there's a lot of soft tissue restriction there. There's a lot of tightness and tone there. And so oftentimes going intrarectally to assess those muscles 
that belie in the pelvic floor can be very effective in creating soft tissue elongation and relaxation. And I use this a lot in conjunction with diaphragmatic breathing exercises to help people alleviate the tone and tension that they have in the pelvic floor region that may be impeding their capacity to effectively evacuate and or retain bowel and or bladder uh, content. So we have several different uh, rehab um, locations. Um, they're listed here on the slide um, that if you uh, are live closer to one of the, these areas and it's more convenient to you that, you know, you could come and, and seek out our services for pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, and we'd be happy to assess and treat and help you in any way that we can. Any questions? That concludes my presentation. There aren't any questions. We do have some questions, uh, Keisha, coming into the chat box. I do want to take a minute to invite everyone to to um, enter any questions you may have into the chat box, and we'll go ahead and I'll throw this one out to to you both um, while some people are entering them in. Um, is there anything you can preemptively do to avoid getting a too tight or too weak pelvic floor? I didn't know if Dr. Bagger wanted to take that or you want me to sure. take it. Sure, we can, I mean, we can both probably tag team that one. So from my perspective as a urologist, what I see a lot of these behavioral therapies that just encourage this tight pelvic floor, right? So holding your urine, um, not going to the bathroom frequently enough, when it is time to go to the bathroom, just kind of pushing, straining, increasing that pelvic floor pressure um, is one of the big causes that I see. Um, you know, it becomes habitual over time. And so if you can avoid those sorts of habits, it makes a big difference. Really anything that decreases pelvic pressure. I tell people to empty their bladder before they work out, go regularly, don't strain and don't push, avoid constipating foods that might encourage you to push. Um, you know, things like that are some of the behavioral things that I usually think of first. Um, Keisha, what are your, some of your other thoughts? I'm gonna give you a chance as well. Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. It's all, it's all about that pressure gradient. Um, oftentimes yeah. I will like to know, um, and people find this strange, but I always like to know hobbies and daily habits, um, things you enjoy doing because sometimes the very things that we do are fine, but it's it's the repetition at which you do something. So if you say, oh, I just really love to go to the gym. Well, if, if you are a lover of like say weightlifting, you wanna make sure that you incorporate an exercise or a weightlifting routine that's safe for your pelvic floor over time. And so I would take a look at just my daily life and daily activities and just ask myself, Am I doing things that could be counterproductive to my pelvic floor health by either producing excess pressure there and straining either recreationally or during evacuation? And do I do enough to um, make like a restorative effort to make sure that I keep good balance? Like, do I ever stretch or do I um, ever do deep breathing? And do I manage my stress levels and, and keep everything under control there? Do I stay well hydrated? Do I eat a balanced diet? And so those are just some, some you know, things that you can do um, to prevent, you know, problems. And, and also, um, you know, being very regimented and routine about getting routine checkups and things like that. You'd be surprised a lot of times people have pelvic floor dysfunction and they really don't know it because it's been going on for so long. It's sort of a new normal that they, accept and so oh I get up five times a night but that's just how it is well you know that's that's urinary frequency and so sometimes you know we're unaware of things that might be amiss if we don't get routine you know checkups and routine visits to our physicians so I think just routine checkups is, is another part of just a healthy lifestyle and very preventative to pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay, um, 
if rehab doesn't assist with pelvic floor issues, is surgery ever required or an option? Yes. Um, different, different, there, so there are different stages of, um, I guess, any, any dysfunction, um, you could say, which is why, to speak to my earlier point, routine, you know, checkups with your physician, with your urologist and people like Dr. Baga are important because a lot of times something be, can be caught early. Um, and if it's caught early enough, depending upon what it is, I mean, obviously if it's, you know, cancer or something like that, that, that requires immediate action. But if it's purely something musculoskeletal and you catch it early enough, it's absolutely possible to do something more conservative and, and preventative, both with Dr. Baga or with a, a phys, pelvic floor physical therapist that may keep you out of needing a surgery. Um, but it, it, it does very much depend upon what specific diagnosis you have and um, to what severity it is, but it is possible to curtail surgery sometimes by coming to rehab. But the other is true as well, where I will, you know, visit with someone and assess and we try um, a traditional course of conservative treatment and surgery is still warranted. It's also very true that even if you have to have surgery, that coming to rehabilitation first can improve your, your therapy um, or your post-surgical um, outcomes particularly as it relates to pelvic floor muscle strength. So sometimes if you say, oh, um, I've, you know, been diagnosed with prostate cancer and I'm definitely going to have to have, you know, um, my prostate removed, leading up to um, a surgery like that, it's always nice to kind of discuss with someone, hey, these are some things you can do prior to your surgery so that you can create some muscle hypertrophy and strengthening and that will help your surgical outcomes thereafter. So it's always nice to go into an invasive procedure with as much muscle tone and strength as well as flexibility as you can so that you have the best possible outcome thereafter. I think um, I can read off a couple of the other questions coming in. Um, related to the surgery question, Dr. Baga, can you speak to maybe what that looks like, what the options are for surgery with pelvic floor? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends a little bit on the problem. The thing with raise, with uh, surgery is it's so razor focused on specific issues, right? So if there's an issue with urinary leakage that isn't solved, then you can do continence procedures, which means procedures that help with the leakage of urine. If you have an overactive bladder and, you know, because of pelvic floor dysfunction and the pelvic floor physiotherapy isn't working, then there are procedures I can do to alleviate some of the overactive bladder, like nerve stimulation and things like that, for example. Um, you know, sexual dysfunction, same thing. So it, there are very specific procedures that can be done, whether it be for the urinary system, the, you know, sexual health, and for the bowel system. Uh, but they rarely kind of encompass everything, right? It's kind of razor focused. And, and that's the brand of surgery is you're really in, in, a, in a very precise fashion handling a specific issue. Uh, but the point of what Keisha is bringing up is very important. I really push when I think there's a pelvic floor physical, pelvic floor etiology, I really push for that PT first because that might not help, might not only help that problem that's really causing the most bother, but the overall constellation of things that could occur related to that pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, the other thing to also consider, sometimes there are adjuvant therapies you can do. So there's certain things you can do that can help with the pelvic floor physiotherapy. So for example, you can have trigger point injections where I can specifically inject uh, the tight tendons of the muscles, kind of relax them, help with some of the pain control in that area. So maybe pelvic floor physiotherapy can be more effective. Hydrodistension is another adjuvant therapy that I sometimes use for patients where I distend their bladder with a steroid to kind of help with some of the uh, dysfunction and assist with some of the healing while they're undergoing physical therapy. So as a, you know, as a multimodality kind of option. So really tailored person to person, but there is a role. Uh, I tend to be a little more conservative to begin, just like Kisha had mentioned, trying to get that pelvic PT uh, first to really help the global issue uh, and prevent uh, worsening. 
All right, thank you. Um, another question that came in is, if you receive radiation but unrelated to prostate cancer or colorectal cancer, does that still increase your risk? Do you still have an increased risk for a pelvic floor disorder? It depends what the organ system that was utilized was. So it's interesting, radiation in general, sometimes it's perceived in an incorrect way. We, you know, oftentimes it's thought that radiation, those beams are directly hitting the tissue and destroying them. Radiation is actually very different. So what radiation is, is radiation is actually absorbed. It's almost like a poison that's absorbed by the cells. And then those cells are unable to regenerate in, in future um, havings. And that's why those specific tissues are, you know, unable to continue to proliferate. Cancer being something that proliferates a lot, they can't proliferate, and that's why the cancer goes away with radiation. That's how radiation works. But what happens with one of the phenomena of radiation is something called forward scatter. So you're targeting a specific organ, and then it hits that organ, but it literally actually bounces off and hits the adjacent organs that are next to it. And then those organs or muscles or nerves absorb that radiation and that causes problems over time as those cells are trying to regenerate. So it depends on the location. Um, generally, if the radiation was done very far away, so for example, you know, in the extremities or the head or something like that, it's pretty unlikely to be associated with pelvic floor dysfunction. But, you know, lower abdominal radiation does have a small risk because it can radiate down in that direction. So it's a really a proximity thing. Okay, and I think, Keisha, this is a question for you on one of your slides you referenced, um, keeping a diary for bowel and bladder. Do you have any suggestions on where you could find kind of a diary that's set up, or I don't know, maybe they even have an app for that? Hmm. Um, if you, I guess, the, to answer your question, yes. Um, obviously, you can find anything um, online, but um, I think probably before you kind of seek out to to keep a, a bladder diary, you might want to just kind of pull up several different types because different diaries have different nuances to them. I use a pretty standard diary that speaks to um, voiding frequency and time. Um, and I quantify the amount based on a small, medium, or large. And we talk about how you quantify the volume of um, evacuation based on like how strong the stream is. Um, and then it also speaks to leakage. So my particular diary asks you to um, quantify how often you have urinary leakage as it relates to urgency versus stress. And it also asks you to quantify how often you feel urinary urgency throughout the day. And um, the last column of my diary is to your um, fluid intake. So that's how my particular diary is structured because it serves a particular pur purpose to construct a tr my treatment program. But there are tons of different bladder diaries out there on the internet that may have different nuances to what's included in the diary. And so I would encourage you to go online, simply type in bladder diary and see what comes up. And for whatever goal or purpose you decide that you would like to keep your own bladder diary, you can see what's there, what, what aligns to, you know, your purpose. But if you're just wanting to kind of track, you know, urine flow, what's in, what's out, there are several different um, diaries that you can log on and get a PDF format for and, and print off and keep on your own at home. Yes. I think you're right, Keisha. You can find anything on the internet. <laughs> Um, all right, I think we have a couple questions we didn't get to, but and I do apologize, but I do encourage folks, if you have questions um, for Dr. Baga, please reach out to him through the Advanced Urology website. Um, and Keisha, I think there was one question about what would be the next steps for rehab, and I'm going to ask you that one, but I'm going to press pause and say, I know Dr. Baga has patients to go see. So we're going to say goodbye to Dr. Baga and thank him so much for hanging out with us today and sharing such valuable information. Um, again, if you want to connect with him directly, please visit Advanced Urology. Um, and thank you, Dr. Baga. We appreciate you sharing such valuable information. Thanks for your time and thanks for what you guys do. This group is awesome. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Baga. And Bye -bye. Keisha, if you could hang out, I will um, ask you, let's see if this question came in. What are some next steps for moving forward with rehab? Yeah. 
Yeah, great. So um, really, really simple. Um, all you would need is a, a prescription from your physician, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a urologist. It can be anyone who's involved in a consistent course of your care, and um, they would need to provide a prescription for physical therapy, and it can just speak to whatever your deficit is, and they would um, pr provide the script, would provide a diagnosis, and that's really all you need. It just be like if you um, needed an antibiotic or um, a, a med over the counter at a CVS or a public pharmacy. It's just as simple as that. It's the same thing. You just get that prescription and then call um, the physical therapy clinic or office of your choice and present them with your prescription, at which time um, you can um, set up for, for sessions. Evaluation first and then sessions thereafter based on the evaluation, yes. Okay, and I think this could be a question. This is a question regarding rehab. Um, what do you think about if someone has a job or their lifestyle where they sit more than six hours a day? Do you have any suggestions for their pelvic floor to prevent any dysfunction? Um, thanks. Yes. Um, so not to sound um, cl cliche, but sitting is the, the new smoking. So anything you can do if you have a sedentary job to eliminate the time you spend sitting is very beneficial. And if your job requires you to be at a computer, I would say strongly look into getting some sort of a standing desk, which would be very, very helpful. So, um, they, it, it's not that you would need to stand all the time, but you do want the capacity to um, alternate your posture throughout the day if you work like a full six hours a day and all of that time is spent seated in front of a computer screen. So I think standing desks have offered people a lot of viable alternatives who previously didn't have any because they're you know, just basically chained to a workstation or chained to a desk. Um, I would also say that when you are not at work, you may want to um, kind of think about a conservative exercise program if you're not familiar with exercises or don't have an exercise regimen that would speak to increasing your overall mobility in your non-working hours. So it's almost like, you know, um, think of it like a bank, right? Um, if you had a bank of, you know, fitness and readiness, the longer you sit, the more you deplete from that bank. So if you had 100 fitness points and you sat for a full six hour day, at the end of the day, maybe you depleted 10 of your fitness points. But if after work you went and you went for a walk in the park or you, you know, went cycling or um, you went to a gym for, you know, did a 30, 40 minute workout, then you would add back, you know, 10 points or five points or whatever it would be, depending on the level of fitness that you incurred, back to your bank. So over a period of time, you can think of it as if the more mobile you are overall, the less fitness depletion that you're going to have, and then the overall health you're going to have of your pelvic floor and just system-wide in general. Thank you. And I think that's a perfect uh, segue to all of us probably needing to stand up and, and take a, a walk around right now. Um, thank you, everybody, so much today for joining in, for sharing such great questions. I put back on the screen the Northside Rehab locations and ways you can connect with them. So if you have additional questions for Keisha, feel free to reach out or any of the rehab team, free, feel free to reach out to the numbers below. As a reminder, today's program is recorded, so we will send out a recording of today's program for you to reference or share with anyone you think may be interested. And again, please visit us at cscatlanta.org, where you can see a complete list of the live and in person, virtual and in person programs that we offer. Thank you, Keisha, so much today. You. you and Dr. Baga, you guys shared such great information. Thank you. All right. We hope to see everybody soon. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. 
or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.